صلوات على محمد محمد اللهم صل على محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان جابر بن عبد الله الانصاري انه قال ان فاطمه الزهراء عليه السلام بنت رسول الله صلى الله عليه واله قال سمعت فاطمه انها قالت دخل علي ابي رسول الله في بعد الايام فقال السلام عليك يا فاطمه فقلت عليك السلام قال اني اجد في بدني ضعفا فقلت له ايدك بالله يا ابتاه من الضعف فقال يا فاطمه ايتيني بالكساء اليماني فغطيني به فاتيته بالكساء اليماني فغطيته به وصرت انزل اليه واذا وجه رياته لعلى كانه البدر في ليله تمامه وكماله اللهم صل على محمد وال محمد فما كانت الا ساعه واذا بولد الحسن قد اقبل وقال السلام عليك يا اما قلت عليك السلام يا قره عيني وثمره فؤادي فقال يا أمه إني أشم إنك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة جد رسول الله فقلت نعم إن جدك تحت الكساء فأقبل الحسن نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جدة يا رسول الله أتأذنوني أن أدخل معك تحت الكساء فقال عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا صاحب حوضي قد أذنت لك قد خلماه تحت الكساء فما كانت إلا ساعة إذا بولد الحسين قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أمه قلت عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا قرة عيني وثمرة فؤادي فقال لي يا أمه إني أشم إنك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة جد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وقلت نعم إن جدك وأخاك تحت الكساء فدنا الحسين نحو النساء وقال السلام عليك يا جداه السلام عليك يا من اختاره الله أتأذنوني أن أكون معكم تحت الكساء وقال عليك السلام يا ولي ويا شعف أمتي قد أزنت لك فدخل ماه ما تحت الكساء فأقبل عند ذلك فأقبل عند ذلك أبو الحسن علي بن أبي طالب وقال السلام عليك يا بنت رسول الله فقلت عليك السلام يا يا أبو الحسن ويا أمير المؤمنين فقال يا فاسمة إني أشم عندك رائحة طيبة كأن رائحة أخي وابن أمي رسول الله فقلت نعم هو ما ولديك تحت الكساء فأقبل علي نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله أتأذنوني أن أكون معكم تحت الكساء قال له وعليك السلام يا أخي ويا وسي وخليفتي وصاحب لوائي قد أذنت لك فدخل علي تحت الكساء قلت نحو الكساء وقلت السلام عليك يا أبتاه يا رسول الله أتأذنوني أن أكون معكم تحت الكساء فقال وعليك السلام يا بنتي ويا بضعتي قد أذنت لك فدخلت تحت الكساء فلما اكتملنا جميعا تحت الكساء أخذ أبي رسول الله بطرف الكساء وأغنى بيده اليمنى إلى السماء وقال اللهم إن هؤلاء أهل بيتي وخاصتي وحمتي لهمهم لهمي ودمهم دمي يؤلمني ما يؤلمهم ويحزنوني ما يحزنهم أنا حرب لمن حاربهم وسلم لمن سالمهم وعدو لمن آذاهم ومحب لمن أحبهم إنهم مني وأنا منهم وجعل سلواتك وبركاتك ورحمتك وغفرانك ورضوانك علي وعليهم وأذهب أنهم الرجس وطهرهم تتهيرا فقال, فقال الله عز وجل يا ملائكاتي ويا سكان السماوات إني ما خلقت سماء مبنية ولا عرضا مبنية ولا قمرا منيرا ولا شمسا مذية ولا فلك يدور 
ولا بحر يجري ولا فلك يسري إلا في محبت هؤلاء الخمسة الذين هم تحت الكساء فقال الأمين جبرائيل يا ربي ومن تحت الكساء فقال الزوجل هم أهل بيت النقوة ومأدن الرسالة هم فاتمة وأبوها وبعلها وبنوها فقال جبرائيل يا ربي أتأذن لي أن أحبط إلى الأرض ليكون ما هم سادسا فقال الله نعم قد أزنت لك فحبت الأمين جبرائيل وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله العلي الأعلى يطرق السلام ويقصك بالتهية والإكرام ويقول لك وإزتي وجلالي نيما خلقت السماء مبنية ولا عرض مبنية ولا قمر منيرا ولا شمس مزية ولا فلك يدور ولا بحر يجري ولا فلك يسري إلا لأجلكم ومحبتكم وقد أذن لي أن أدخل ما تنفهل فأذنوا لي يا رسول الله فقال رسول الله عليك السلام يا أمين وحي الله إنه نعم قد أذنت لك فدخل جبرائيل معنا تحت الكساء قال لعبي إن الله قد أوفى إليكم يقول إنما يريد الله ليرهب أنكم ومدس أحل البيت ويطحركم تتهيرا فقال علي لأبي يا رسول الله أخبرني ما لجلوسنا هذا تحت الكساء من الفضل إن الله فقال النبي فقال النبي والذي بعثني بالحق نبيا واستفاني بالرسالة نجيا ما دخل خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل أهل الأرض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا إلا ونزلت عليهم الرحمة وحفت بهم الملائكة وصرفت لهم على أن يتفرقوا فقال علي إذا والله فزنا وفاز شيعتنا ورب الكعبة فقال النبي الثاني يا علي والذي بعثني بالحق نبيا واستفاني بالرسالة نجيا ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل أهل الأرض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا وفيه مهموم إلا وفرج الله حمه ولا مهموم إلا وكشف الله غمه ولا طالب حاجة إلا وخز الله حاجته فقال علي إذا والله فزنا وسئدنا وكذلك شيعتنا فازوا وسئدوا في الدنيا والآخرة ورب الكعبة Please recite a loud salwat. Can you please invite our guest English lecturer to say the Imran Hasim with the loudest of your salwat? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي يا لولا عن هدان الله الصلاة والسلام وتهيت والإكرام على رسول المسدد والمصطفى العمجد والمحمود الأحمد سيدنا ومولانا ومولى الكونين وجد الحسن والحسين عاني أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الماسومين المظلومين ولعنة الله علائهم أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلو أخذ دم اللساني يفقه قولي الله تعالى في الكتاب الكريم فقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تلبسوا الحق بالباطل وتكتموا الحق وانتم تعلمون صدق الله العلي العظيم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى اولاد الحسين وعلى اصحاب الحسين ورحمه الله وبركاته صلوات الله عليه وسلم صلى So we have been doing a historical analysis of the 
status given to the Ahlul Bayt by historians of Muslims. What has history said about the Ahlul Bayt And we have been doing a historical analysis and we have spoken about what the truth is and how Imam Ali is related to the truth. What the status was given to Rasulullah's uh, uncle, his wife, Rasulullah himself. Then we spoke about the daughter of Rasulullah and yesterday we reached on the discussion on Imam Ali and what these three said about. Now, today it is the end of Arbaeen. You understand what Arbaeen is? It is the 40 days after the baptism of Imam Hussain. Now, my Topic is not finished yet. I have not finished about Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib al -Islam. So I will speak a little bit about it half of, half of the time. And the rest I will speak about Arbaeen. What is Arbaeen? What is the significant, significance of Arbaeen? And how we are meant to understand this day. On this evening and tomorrow is the day. So we reached a discussion with Imam Ali alayhi salam. And we were talking about, you know, 1400, more than 1400 years ago, Ali ibn Abi Talib faced stiff opposition from Muslims, very stiff opposition from Muslims. Even after his death, which is now 1403 and a half years ago now, he faced a lot of opposition. After his death, his character was maligned. There was an organized method of character assassination of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib And it continued and it continued. Now, the opposition is not as vociferous and it's not as blatant as it was in the days gone by. But there are still pockets in the world where Imam Ali -Islam is opposed. And there are groups of people who do not rate Imam Ali -Islam or give status that he deserves. In fact, history has never given him the status that he deserves. So what happened there is because history was so one-sided, so skewed, I will ask a question now here again. And for you all to think about this point, was it correct to malign Ali Islam all those years now? If it was correct, then why is he in the list of Ulfa Rashidin? Did the later scholars make a mistake by including him in the Khulfa Rashidin? Khulfa Rashidin means the rightly guided caliphs of Islam. And he is among the list of Khulfa who were rightly guided. So how come the later scholars, and even now, they said, Ali ibn Abi Talib is a Khalifa of the Muslim, the Khalifa Rashid of Muslim. He's the fourth Caliph, as they say. So that is one thing. So how come these people are including him in the Khalifa Rashid? And if they are correct, then what about the scholars in those days gone by, which were maligning Ali al -Islam, abusing Ali al -Islam from the pulpits of the masjids? What about those people? If they are wrong, then we have to question each and every scholar. Each and every scholar has to be questioned about his belief, his faith, his narrations, his works, his books, and all that. Everything becomes questionable about those scholars who were writing these things about Ali al Islam and speaking these things about Ali al Islam. Everything become, comes into question, and we have the right to ask this question of history that. We need to come to the point where it is proven without doubt that the Muslim Ummah was not deceived by these scholars. If he was deceived, then we need to take them to the task and punish them as history should punish them. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. See, Ali is not just a name which is given meaning by the combination of three letters A, L, I, right? Ali means knowledge. Ali means wisdom. Ali means bravery. Ali means the protector of Islam. Ali means the supporter of Rasulullah. Ali means the defeating of falsehood. And Ali means the raising up of the truth. This is what Ali stands for. It is not just a simple thing that you can malign somebody. And still now, he has that greatness amongst Muslims and amongst non-Muslims as well. So there is something about this person there that has not been able to be shut down. There is something very, very important, as I mentioned a few things yesterday, but how Imam Ali al-Islam 
has risen above all the malignants that has happened to him and his name after so many years. And still we have so much respect for the Imam alayhi salam. Not just amongst the Shias who call themselves the followers of Ali, also amongst the Sunnis who call Imam Ali alayhi salam as the fourth caliph and the Sufis who call him the fountainhead of all the silsila, all the chains of Sufis. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. See, Islam is a very, very honorable, upright religion. It's a complete religion. It came to a people who were meant to be, the Muslims were meant to be honorable and upright. They were sent a great prophet and a comprehensive book of guidance so that they could be on the straight path. However, they left the real leaders of Islam and they became weak and they became so weak and so cowardly that they could be played by any power that was worth any significance at all. So this is what has become the situation of the Muslims and it is mainly started from leaving Imam Ali al And you know, people who are listening to this online or any other people, any friends you mentioned, they might say, you always keep talking about Ali Ali. So why do I talk about Ali? Am I mad? Do I have no sense that I should talk about somebody else when there is somebody else important or more important than Ali Ali Abi Talib al-Islam? Show me somebody who was more successful in whatever he did in a short space of time. Show me the qualities in a person that Ali Ibn Abi Talib had so that I can respect that person even more. There is none. At least I can't find, can't find one. Let me show me somebody and I will show him that respect. If you can't show me that person, then come to me and listen who Ali Ibn Abi Talib is. That's the message I want to pass on today. So it has been an ongoing issue with us trying to say something and being shut down because, uh, you know, people don't want to listen to anything which is different from what their grandfathers and their grandfathers have taught them. It has become a culture. You know, you can change a person's behavior, you can change a person's outlook, but you cannot change the culture so easily. But culture is so ingrained in people through generations of behaving in a certain manner that their culture decides how they will perform or practice a religion. The culture decides. And sometimes, and in fact, many times, there's a danger that the religion itself, you know, becomes more cultural than actually what religion is meant to be. Because it's easier to imbibe the culture because everybody's doing it. Culture is societal, right? It is time bound as well. But whatever it is, it is done with the consensus or the general agreement of people who do a certain thing certain ways. People here who are sitting here, they ask me questions. Why do we do this that way? What is that thing? And I've mentioned answers to some of the young people who ask me questions here about certain things. And I've mentioned the word culture over there as well. It's not always wrong culture, but when religion is mixed with culture and religion, the actual religious practices are watered down and culture overpowers the real religion, that is a problem. Religion should be practiced the way religion is meant to be practiced. And you cannot have your own opinion on religion and practice it with your own opinion. It doesn't work like that. Rasulullah brought the religion and that is how it was meant to be practiced. And the Aima Athar for 250 years made sure that that practice remained, even though it remained with a certain few people. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. You know, Muslim lands are pretty blessed. You know, what, what we refer to as Muslim countries, they are pretty blessed with resources. You know, what we call as the black gold or the petroleum. It flows in those countries. It flows in those countries. And yet you see poverty and destitution in those countries as well. How come that is the case? You know, people in those countries are hungry as well. How come they are hungry? That is the curse of not following Ali ibn Abi Talib al -Islam. Now again, this statement will come to anything you want, you say because of Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib al -Islam. I will give you evidence. I won't just talk like that and say, well, you know, it is my statement and you have to believe it. No, I will give you certain examples and certain reasons why I'm saying that. You know, there was a time when Imam Ali al -Islam was the caliph. He was there for only four and a half hours in power. Because when he was the fourth caliph, when he became the fourth caliph, after being selected, or not just selected, literally being 
pushed to take the leadership because there was so much corruption developing in the Muslim Ummah. So people came and said, you have to do it. Otherwise, you know, we won't go away from here. So he took it on. And then he established and put governors in places which he thought were upright. He got a news. He got a news that one governor in Basra is enjoying a great banquet or a party where all the rich people are invited, all the important people are invited. There's lots of big, you know, nice foods everywhere. And he is there eating. And there are four people, there were poor people who were outside waiting for the leftovers of the food to be thrown away in the bins so that they could eat. And he heard that. And then he wrote to his government, how dare you do that when people are hungry and you are enjoying the food over there? So, you know, he said, if you see anybody going hungry in the Muslim lands, remember that somebody is eating their shit unjustly. So in the, in the time of the Imam, when he was a caliph, he used to be the poorest person in society. Can you believe it? The king of Muslims was the poorest person in society. He used to wear the most coarse clothes. He used to have two pairs of dresses. And that's about it. And he used to go to the market to buy clothes because it was torn or something. He would buy better clothes for his servant than for himself. So that's how big he was. Because he did not want to live a standard of life in which some person will come up and say on the day of Qayama that I had nothing and my caliph was wearing these nice wineries. He was eating the nice food. That's how strict he was on himself. He is our role model. And because Muslims left the role model, you know, everything, you know, everything, if you look at any walk of life, whether it is sport, whether it's your football team, whether it's your cricket team, whether it's your workplace, anywhere, the leader is the most important. The captain is most important. If he is playing well and he's leading by example, then people tend to follow and toe the line. Whether it's cricket or rugby or football, or it's your workplace. If there is nepotism in your workplace, it starts from the top. You might try to reduce it at your level, but if nobody cares at the top, it won't be uprooted. It will still come back as soon as the moment comes up. So the leadership is extremely important. People talk about what happened if Ali was not the leader. So what? Somebody else can be the leader. No, because the problems that we have in our society nowadays, it is because the leadership was corrupt and always has been corrupt because the rightful leaders were not given a chance. Their, their rights were usurped and taken away and the rightful leaders could not come and lead the community. If the rightful leaders had led the community for, let's say, Imam al had the chance to rule the entire Muslim lands for 250 years, can you imagine the people under them, how strong they would be? How upright they would be? You know, how much strength they would have of character? You couldn't buy them out for money. Because the Imam is so strong in their character and the belief system. They have tabakkul of Allah that Allah will be with them. If not in this world, they don't get the richest, they will get the best out in Akhara. Because there has to be the belief which manifests very clearly amongst Muslims that the real life and the long life ex is, is existing after this world. This world is only 50, 60, 80, 100 years. But what about the life which goes under the grave when we go into the grave? It lasts for at least 100,000 years, if not more. 100,000. Can you imagine that number? If not more. Can you imagine the people who died at the time after Adam al Islam? They're still in their grave. They're still living their life. So this is a long life ahead of us there. And then we have the eternal life after the day of Bayamah. Either we be in Jahannam or Jannah. Inshallah, we all be in Jannah. If we follow the right examples of our Aymah, our Islam. Salatullah Muhammad wa Muhammad. Now let's talk about the housing problem in Muslim communities. Even in the UK, we have homeless people, right? There is no reason why the UK should have homeless people. It's a comparatively rich country. It has resources. And there's mismanagement or all that stuff that is there. But in Muslim lands, as I mentioned, they are very rich Muslim lands. And it is said that the Muslim Ummah is like one body. If something goes wrong in one part of the body, the whole body goes sick. You should feel the pain. Muslims should feel the pain of others. For example, if your tummy is upset, it's not just your tummy that feels bad. Of course the tummy feels bad. And you have fever and headache and you're feeling weak and all that stuff, everything up. 
don't feel like eating food, all that thing happens. So the entire body is now feeling down. That is how the Muslims should feel for each other. And that is not happening. That's why people are poor, they're living in shanty towns, they're living in congested places and all that. Why is this happening? Again, I would say it's a curse of not following Ali ibn Abi Talib al -Islam. And again, people will accuse me, you just need an excuse to put Ali ibn Abi Talib everywhere. I said, let me give you another example. Let me give you another example. He had a governor who built a house when he was in office during the time of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib al -Islam, He built a house. So Imam wrote to him. He said, listen, I heard you built a house for yourself. Let me say something. If you have built this house with the money of the Muslims, then you have built two houses, not one. One that you're living in now, the new house that you built, and one you built in Jahannam. Because you have misappropriated the money of the Muslims. It is corruption. You cannot use the money of the Muslims for your own gain. If you have made it with your own money, let me put it this way, that you know, this house will remain of yours, but one day your body will be taken out from this house as well, because death will come to you. So Imam was so strict that everybody should have a house. He was very stern on the people who represented him in different provinces, wherever his leadership was. So that's why I say, if this leader was there everywhere, every time, if this kind of leader is available every time, then which Muslim will be living in Shanti Town? Everybody will have an appropriate state, uh, appropriate state, space. Nobody will be living in huge mansions and some people living in shanty towns. No, everybody will have some kind of a decent space to live in, depending on what kind of family they have, are they alone? Everybody will have a house. In the Islamic government, when I say Islamic government, I don't mean the governments in the Muslim lands. In a real Islamic government, housing is not a privilege. It is a necessity. It is to be given to everybody. So nowadays you see, when we live in London, the rent is like going sky high. Everybody's complaining, oh my God, the rent is so high. We can't afford to. And then we can't afford to buy anymore. But even though I can get a mortgage, my salary is only like 50,000. I can't buy a house in London because the prices are like 800,000, 900,000. In Islamic government, it is a right of every person to have a house for himself every person who is having a family. So if we have such leaders, will there be a housing problem where he is being strict or even in, on his governors that even if you built it with your own money, remember, you will be dying one day in this house. This house will remain, but you will not be there. So if somebody is like, you know, a group of governors in his caliph is sitting together and listening to this letter being read out and this guy is saying, I built it with my own money and he reads from the caliph that if you think that this is your house, this house will remain, but you will die. And if you hear such a statement, other people start thinking, oh my God, I shouldn't build my house in any case. Another fancy house because I will die. So wherever I'm living is comfortable enough for me. It's enough space for me. So all these people will think in a manner where it is the thought process is driven by a righteous leader. As I mentioned, it is all driven from the top. And if you have the righteous leader who is strong, who leads by example, then that's how people tend to behave. And if this was one righteous leader after another, then it becomes a pattern in society. It becomes a habit. And that habit builds a character. And that character makes a society which is upright. That's how one should be. Salaam Muhammad wa Muhammad. Are you all with me? Or am I talking something which is nonsense? Are you all with me? Make sense? Yeah? You can ask questions at the end, otherwise this is going to go very long. So now, let's come to education. It is a shame for all Muslims, all of us, you and me and all included, that this community who's a Rasul, more than 1440 years ago, said that it's duty for every man and woman to get educated. Every man and woman to get educated. In the time of Imam Ali al Islam, in his caliphate of four and a half years, in which he had to deal with three wars as well, remember. And despite all the wars, he was able to deal with these societal issues. These issues of what we call social issues nowadays. He made it necessary. 
he made a notice, he gave notice to all his governors, wherever he was there. That every child must be given an education. It was necessary for every child to go and get an education. And there was no charge for getting going to school. Everybody was supposed to get an education. His own daughter used to teach people in Kufa, the ladies, and the ladies and their daughters. Everybody was involved, was educated, was involved in teaching the Muslim Ummah, because the Muslim Ummah needs to be educated. However, after Imam Ali al -Islam, this thing was not given much importance. And you can see the consequences now, I'll come to that, but what has happened is the rulers of Islam and their cronies who are scholars, they work together. It is very easy to remember something. It is very easy to lead a group of uneducated, ignorant people, because you can sway them anywhere with pure mongering or with any kind of propaganda. It is very easy to do. What we call, you know, we, you must have heard these kind of terminologies, especially my dear elder over there, that, you know, people are like sheep. You can take them anywhere you want through fear, through propaganda, through certain messages. You can make them believe what you want them to believe. That is why we have 24 7 news channels so that you get the same news fed 24 hours a day so that you get a certain mentality and that is what has been that will happen in the days gone by as well the rulers made sure that the people believed in the religion that was taught by their scholars paid up by the rulers paid up by the establishment that is what they wanted the people to learn and nobody was given the chance to pursue their own free education, a wholesome education. They were only given the chance to study what they were taught by the establishment. People became time passing, people became ignorant in real history of Islam, in the real knowledge about the religion. What is right and what is wrong started getting, you know, confused. And that's how they developed the society. And we have reached a point now that Muslims, in general, are highly uneducated as a group. You don't think about yourself, I'm going to college, I'm going to university, I'm, I'm an engineer, you know, I'm in IT, I'm a doctor, I'm studying in school, I'll become a doctor one day. Okay, fine, good, excellent. And I remember I said the other day to some of you over there, that, you know, you study something in which if the Imam turns up now, your knowledge and your skills will be useful for him. Learn something that will be useful for the Imam. Focus on the Imam, that if he turns up now, which is why it's important to learn who the Imam is. What does he want? What does he expect from us? Me and you, we are all supposed to be his soldiers. We are all supposed to be part of his mission. And if we develop the mission in a proper manner, then, <coughs> then only he will turn up. Then only Allah will give the permission. Okay, now these boys are ready. You can go now and take on the world, the injustice that you are on in the world. You are the leader now. And that is when he'll come. He'll not come in and prepare you all. The preparation for the preparation, Allah has already sent Rasulullah with books and hadiths, and he sent Imams one after the other so that we prepare and keep preparing and get ourselves ready for the real tussle that is going to happen at the end of the time when the Imam turns up. So we have to be ready to, to support the Imam, not just, okay, when he comes in, I'll start learning, I'll start preparing them. No, no, no. You have to prepare now. You practice now in your tennis game, for example, so that you can play well in Wimbledon. You don't turn up at Wimbledon and say, okay, I'll practice now. And then, uh, then what are you going to play then? The others have practiced for 20 months or one year or whatever the case might be. And they've been working out in the gyms and they've been having the night, right nutrition and waking up early, sleep, uh, sleeping not too late, not playing too many video games, you know, playing enough to entertain yourself, refreshing, and then focusing on the main goal. Our main goal is to focus on the Imam of our time, who is the representative of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all this is leading to that point. When, we, when I'm talking about Imam Ali al he is the leader who has given us the examples. And that is why we learn from examples. Our leader has given us the example on how to live. Education is extremely important. I say Ali Ali all the time because Ali taught us human beings how to become human. You know, there is no difference between a human and an animal apart from knowledge. You know, a bird, if you look at bird, whatever you have, whichever bird you want to pick out from your house, which comes in the morning, that bird lived in the same house now as it lived maybe a thousand years ago. Right? 
a lion lives in a den. It lived in a den 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Human beings 3,000 years ago lived in caves. Now we live in proper houses with central heating. 150, 200 years ago, we didn't have central heating. We used to burn fire in the, in the house. Now we have gas running through, electricity running through with central heating. So human beings develop their skills through knowledge all the time. That is what makes us human. We know that we should not take somebody else's property because we have been educated not to do that. Animals don't do that. If an animal is hungry, he doesn't realize that it's Maulana sitting here with a young man sitting there. I want to eat this guy, I'm going to eat it. That's it. He's got no education. That's the way he's supposed to live. If he has a desire, he's meant to fulfill the desire. That's the animal. But a human being has to control his desire. Has to control his desire. And Imam Ali salam showed it by example. He was the king. That time the kings were referred to as caliphs. He was the king of the entire Muslim community. But yet, he chose to live a very, very simple, hard life. He could have had any wealth he wanted. Just like the others did in the past and in the future. You know, Muslim societies, Muslim rulers have had fantastic palaces and fantastic courts. You know, but Imam Ali Hassan chose not to. He focused on giving people education, housing, giving them the right knowledge so that they get on the right path. See, a rightful person never fears in giving everybody education. Why do you fear people have the knowledge? You fear people have the knowledge because then they will become better than me or they will become more powerful than me. What am I going to do then? But a righteous person does not care about it. I am on the right. If you become better than me, so the good on them. Why not? Go on. Good on you. Work hard. Become better than me. And it's said, a proverb they said that the greatness of a teacher is that his student becomes better than him. If the teacher says, no, I am not going to impart him the full knowledge because if he gets full knowledge, then he's so talented, he'll become better than me. That's not a great teacher. The greatness of a teacher is when he educates his student in such a manner that the student becomes better than the teacher. So you all, your parents have worked hard to bring you here in whatever position you are in now. It is up to you now to show to your parents that because you've invested so much in me, I will become better than what you were so that I can contribute, if not as much, even more than with what you could. Because they face challenges and you will face challenges as well. But because you have the resources given to you by the parents, that makes one thing important is the fact that you have to contribute even more than your parents could. And that is what you should take from today's majlis, inshallah. So we have all these things about Imam Ali al that I mentioned. He was big on education. All these things that he did as far as knowledge was concerned. Yesterday I mentioned about, you know, he was the only one who could say from the member, ask me, ask me before you lose me. There was nobody who could say, ask me anything and I'll answer you. There were some people who dared, but they were shown up. But Imam Ali al he used to say, ask you about the pathways in the heaven. I know all the pathways of heaven. He was the one who said he could light up the entire land of Iraq with the river Euphrates. Do you know why? Because he said he could use the water and generate what we call nowadays hydroelectricity. But the rulers did not let him. He never took any ideas. Right from the time when he wrote the Quran, which Rasulullah used to teach the Sahaba, when he brought it in front of the caliph of that time, they said, no, we don't want your Quran. We don't want your Quran. And that Quran had the, the translation, the teachings, explanation of the verses, the tafsir and the ta'wil, everything about knowing the details in the Quran. Because as you know, the Quran has several layers of meanings, not just the words that are there, not just the Arabic sentence that is there. It has got different layers of meaning, depths of meanings. And these depths of meanings are only known by the purified people, which is the Ayma of Haraj of the Majmeen. Not the Maulana across the street. Maulana might know. He studied many, many years, 10, 20 years. Every study he's gone some knowledge. But the real knowledge of the Quran is with the Majmeen. And Imam Ali al wrote down the meanings and all that stuff, but they did not accept their Quran. So don't forget it. Can you imagine if we knew the reality of the Quran now, 
how much more close would be would we be with the Quran? And the previous generations will be even closer to the Quran. So this is the injustice that history has done to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. I have more pages to talk about Imam Ali Islam, but I cannot now because I need to focus on another topic, which is extremely important as well. So in the light of whatever I have mentioned right now, we can clearly say that history has done injustice to Imam Ali Islam. And whatever the reason was, I'm not focusing on that. All I'm saying, which I've been saying every night, is that because there are situations in history which are very clear that there was something wrong with the historians of that time. I want to start a new investigation. I implore all the Muslims, because the sheikhs and the Maulana do not listen to me. They will say, who is this upstart who's going to ask me and challenge me about knowledge? I ask all educated Muslims to question what is in there, to listen to me as a questioner, to start an investigation onto what you have been told and check out why I'm talking like that. And if you have questions to ask me, then ask me. But I want to, you go around and tell your friends who are not from the Maktab of the Ahlul Bayt, tell them to ask questions. Why have you been taught this? Why do I speak like that? Why do I pray this way and you pray that way? What has been hidden from you or from me? If you have a better argument, tell me. If I don't have a better argument, then I will follow you. But if I have a better argument, and you are an educated and intellectual person, you will think about this is the right way. This is how it should be. So let's have a dialogue open, but we have to investigate history, why they were so harsh and so unjust and unfair to the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. What I'm going to talk about now, let me see what time it is now. What I'm going to talk about now is the fact about this day that we have, this evening that we are sitting in. It is the 20th of Safar. The Safar is a month of the Islamic calendar. Not the English suffer where you suffer pain and fever and suffer hunger. No, not that suffer. Suffer is a month, the second month of the English, of the Islamic calendar. 20th of Safar marks 40 days since Imam Hussein al-Islam was martyred in Karbala. And we, it is an extremely important day for us. And so why, you know, 40 days ago he was killed. We, we commemorated Ashura. We did so many majalis. And we are coming to your majalis. What is important about this day? Let's talk about it. What is important about this? Day. There are two or three aspects which I want to talk about, about Arbaeen. So this is going to be a lesson, an education for you, what we are talking about. So I would request your attention like you have been giving to me every day. Okay? And I want you to ask me questions on whatever I've said. So if you don't ask me questions, I'll be upset with you after the majlis. Remember that. Okay? The regulars know that we have a good uh, question and answer session here, 15, 20 minutes and all that. So inshallah, you will ask me questions again. What is Arbaeen? Arbaeen is the word for 40. 4040 in English is Arbaeen. 40 days in, Ar in Arabic is known as Arbaeen. We are commemorating the 40 days after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein al-Islam. Now, in Islam, the number 40 holds significance. It holds significance. Why? The Quran says that as well. It says that Allah subhanahu wa says that we sent Musa to the Mount of Tur, Mount of Sina. Sinai Mount is still in Egypt. I've gone on top of that when Musa al-Islam was sitting there for 40 nights. Allah subhanahu wa asked him to come there for 30 nights initially. And then he increased it by 10. So he wanted 40 nights so that he could give him the tablet, the Torah. So it was there in the Quran, 40 nights. It is said that a baby remains in the mother's womb for 40 weeks. You say nine months, nine months, the baby is what? It's 40 weeks. It could be a little early, a little late, doesn't matter. But the full gestation period of a human baby is 40 weeks. It is said that the human being at the age of 40, reaches the top of his abilities, whether it's physical, intellectual, whatever. And after 40, the decline of the human being starts to begin. What does that mean? What, what impact does that have on us? So you all who are now 15, 20, 25, 30, very happy, you have lots of time, mashallah. I don't have that time, that's my gone. The thing is, by the time you're 40, Whatever good habits you have are strengthened in you by that time. Whatever bad habits you have are strengthened in you by that time. It is said that by the time you're 40, 
all your habits are complete in you. You're making a full development as a human being. That's it done. It doesn't mean that you cannot change after, change after 40. You can change after 40, but it's a lot more difficult, which is why your parents say, study hard when you're young. Otherwise, it becomes more difficult when you grow up. We all know our parents are so right when they say, study hard when you're young. Why do you want to blow words like cricket? So what, no, I don't want to study now. I've done my homework, Allah. But no, it is important that you use your youth in such a manner that later on, you don't think, oh, I wish I'd done that. What my mom said was very good. You only realize how intelligent your mom and dad were when you become their age. You only realize that. But if you are smart enough and very, very intelligent, you will listen to your parents, whatever guidance they give you now. At this age, if you listen to your parents and work according to their plan, not play only video games or not play with your friends all the time, it's important to play. Let me get it right. It, it is important to play, but play is for refreshing your mind and body. But then, you, as I mentioned, you have to focus on the real goal, which is working for Imam al Hujja alayhi salam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So by the time you're, you're 40, you become fixed in your ideas, in your abilities. And that is why they said that the man becomes complete or a person becomes complete as far as abilities are concerned and by the age of 40. Now, there are people who have learned new languages at the age of 60. There are people who have learned new software skills at the age of 50, 60, 70. New instruments to play, all that stuff they have done later on as well. But it is harder to develop new skills. It is harder to accept change after a certain age. No. Nowadays, you can live in a dorm very comfortably. You go, you live with 10 other boys, no problem. You know, you can, in university, you can live like that. But at the age of 50, if you're telling you to share the room with 10 other boys, it's no, I want my own space, I want my own bathroom, I want my own kitchen. But as I, in, when you're young, when you're with, the, with that developmental stage, you can do that easily, much more easier, let's say. Some people might be still be loath to do that, but it is easier to adapt when you're younger. So that is the another thing about 40. You know, it, it is said that when somebody dies and you put that person in the grave, this is in the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That when you put that person in the grave, after the grave is closed, if 40 people, 40 people pray for forgiveness of the man or the woman, Allah will forgive that person. Can you imagine how Rahim Allah is? People, I don't know the realities of that person. I know he was this person's father or that person's mother or brother or sister. I don't know, but I just go there and I pray for the dead person because it's, the, the time in the grave is a bit lonely because there's no mom and dad over there, no brothers and sisters to play with or anything like that. So we pray that all their, the, the dead person, all the ease come to that person. And we seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that person. 40 is the number given. If 40 people do that, Allah will forgive that person. Which is why it is important to go into these burials, into these janazas, so that if you do nothing, you can just pray for that person. Right? So all these things I'm trying to say, the significance of the number 40. <coughs> Similarly, for 40, after 40 days of martyrdom, it is said, and it is a very complex topic and a long topic. I'm sure there will be lots of questions on this, but we'll have to have another ashram for that. It is said that the soul of the human being is attached to the physical presence of the dead person for up to 40 days, and then it starts detaching itself totally from the body that has passed now. So all these things make the number 40 quite significant. And there are many other issues. These are the top five or six I mentioned right now because it came to my mind. Many things about the number 40. So 40 has a significance in the Islamic ideology, in the Sharia, in whatever we believe in. Now, that is one reason why I commemorate the 40th of Imam Hussein al Islam. Then you can say, well, if you can come up with the 40th of Imam Hussein al Islam, why not for all the other Aima? Why not for Imam Ali al Islam? We respect him a lot. We respect all the Aima the same. They were great people. They were the greatest people of their time. What about Imam Hassan al Islam? Why don't we do the Arbaeen of Imam Hassan al Islam? Imam Ali al Islam? Why only Imam Hussein al Islam? I tell you something, this is very, very close to what our aqidah, our belief system is our roots of our faith. Because the fact that 
Imam Hussein Alayhisselam's death is closely linked to the destiny of all Mumini. The way he was slaughtered in Karbala, nobody else from the Masumin was had suffered that much. The way he was done with so-called Muslims dealing with him in such a harsh way, not just him, his family members, his children, his friends, they all dealt with him in a, such a harsh way. And all the people in opposition, the, all the people who said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And there were Hafiz of Quran there. And there were Hajis there. And there were people who were performing namaz on time every day. These people did what they did to Imam Hussein and his family and his friends. The way Imam Hussein suffered, nobody suffered. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this plan that this person, this close creation of mine, my very, very lovable creation is not going to be forgotten. And anybody who comes to Imam Hussein Islam will be close to salvation. And if our salvation is linked to Imam Hussein Islam, it is important we remember him in every moment as we can. It is said, it's not said about anybody. When you drink water, remember Hussein. Why? Because Imam was killed thirsty. He was still thirsty three days. He was no water. If one day in Aftar, in the month of Ramadan, there is no cool drink for you and no food prepared by your mom, you will start getting jittery. And you start getting annoyed. Where's the food? I'm hungry now. It's Aftar time. What for that? Three days, no water. And for little children, age like you were sitting in the front row here. They did not have water. Can you feel how they must have felt? You cannot because you've drunk the water. Try not drinking water the whole day tomorrow, just one day. Tell me how you drink. In the evening, when I come in, just try drinking no water, no food, and then you will feel close to the pain of those children, of those people, and they have to fight the battle. And Imam Hussein al Islam had to bring up dead bodies in that state. And dead bodies of who? His own flesh and blood. So our destiny, our salvation is very closely linked to Imam Hussein al Islam. This is Allah's plan that it is going to happen if you want to get. Salvation, the hadith from Imam Sadiq al -Islam, that Hussein is Safinatul Najat and Misbahul Huda. What does that mean? He's the, he's the boat, a ship of salvation and the light. Misbahul Huda, light of guidance. Safinatul Najat means the boat which will lead to salvation and the light which will lead to guidance. But people ask him, hey, you know, aren't you all the same? You all the boat of salvation, you all the light of guidance. And Imam Sadiq al Islam replied, Yes, we all are, but Hussein's ship is very big, it has space for everybody. And Hussein's light is very sharp. Anybody who gets on Hussein's boat, Hussein's ship, will be led to salvation. That's another thing that is important. You see why we commemorate Imam Hussein al Islam, how tragic his death was by some people who claim to be the Ummah of Rasulullah who claim to be Muslim. So this is another thing, why we do the commemoration of Imam Hussein al-Islam al-Arbaim, not all the Aima or not all of us. We might do, we are not stopped from doing it, but there's a big emphasis on the Arbaim of Imam Hussein al-Islam. One more thing I'll tell you about the importance of the Arbaim of Imam Hussein al-Islam is a hadith by Imam Hassan al-Askari al-Islam. You know, Imam Hassan al-Askari is the father of our current Imam, right? He's the 11th Imam, Imam Hassan al-Askari al-Islam. He's the father of our current Imam. He said, and remember, every Imam saying is like proof for us to follow. And he said, there are five signs of a moment. Moment is a person who has Imam, full Imam. Five signs of a moment. What are they? One, a person who prays. 51 rakat every day, in which there are 17 rakats which are mandatory, budget, so all inclusive 51 rakats. The second, somebody who prostrates on earth in such that, prostrates on the earth, on the mud. Second, that's a sign of a moment. Third, one who wears a ring on the right hand, that's the third sign of a moment. Fourth, the one who does the ziyarat of Arba'in. Ziyarat of Arba'in is the fourth sign which makes you moment. And the fifth is in the Salat, when you when you do the Salat, the, all those rakats which you do softly, 
you in that in those ones you recite bismillah rahman rahim aloud before reciting the surah just the bismillah part all these five things are signs of a moment if we want to be moment what happens if you are a moment a moment it will be easy for them to reach salvation to be successful in the afterlife when you don't have your moment that will help you no brothers and sisters to support you then these things which we live now make it easier for us and when Imam Afsan Asli says ziyarat of arbain is important which is tonight and tomorrow till maghrib time is the day of arbain reciting the ziyarat of arbain of imam husain alaihi salam is incumbent on all of us who can it is supposed to be done in the morning after the sun rises not during fajr time but after fajr has finished the sun comes out until it reaches the top so you can really recite it any time but it's preferred to recite as early as possible in the morning but before zuhur most people do that so if you cannot recite in arabic recite it in whichever language you can but do it make it. and tomorrow it's easy for all of you because it's a saturday you don't have to go to school not to uni not to work most people don't have to work tomorrow so it is incumbent to all of us to take this opportunity to recite the ziyarat al arbain of imam husain al azhar so you see why we commemorate because imam hasan al asqalani said that it is so important to recite the ziyarat al arbain al azhar the arbain of ziyarat al arbain of imam husain al azhar he didn't say go on ziyarat because not everybody can go on ziyarat some people might not have the resources some people might know and not be well enough or healthy enough or have the resources to travel there might be issues many issues that makes a person not being able to go and visit the shrine of imam husain al azhar but everybody who needs to read who knows how to read and write can recite the ziyarat of imam husain al azhar and you all have smartphones there are apps on there and there are books in everybody's houses you can go and recite it in any language you can in the morning inshallah ta'ala with the intention of getting closeness to the imam remember if you seek intention of getting close to imam husain al azhar then if the imam likes it he will bring himself close to you and then what will happen is you will have a better understanding of the imam and you'll be close to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all these things help us to get into a better situation for our afterlife also for success in this world inshallah sallallahu alaihi muhammad wa ali muhammad it is said that the people all the relatives of imam husain alaihi salam who were captured all the ladies all the ahlul bayt who were captured they returned to karbala on the 40th day of the martyrdom of imam husain alaihi salam bibi zainab imam sajjad alaihi salam imam qutsum all these people were captured his wives were there all that they were captured they returned to karbala on the 40th of day of the martyrdom of imam husain alaihi salam on the 20th of safar it is said And the first zahir, the first visitor of Imam Hussein al Islam's tomb, was on this day. It was Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari, who was a very old man who could not even see, and he went with his friend Atiya from Medina. When he heard the news that Hussein has been killed, he was in tears. He was shaken up, and then he took his friend to say, "Guide me to that place." And he went there, and when he reached the place in Karbala, he first had ghusl in the river. He changed his clothes, and then he went to visit Imam Hussein al-Islam. And he went there, and he kept saying "Assalamu alaikum, Ya Hussein." There was no reply, and he kept saying "Salam to Imam Hussein al-Islam." And when there was no reply, after the third time, he said, "How are you going to reply to your friend Hussein when your veins have been cut off from your neck? How can you reply? I understand you can't reply." but your friend is here your friend is here to visit you and i am so saddened by what has taken place and he was wailing on the tomb and he was you know giving his greetings and all his love pouring out to wherever he thought the tomb of imam husain al islam was that his friend said there is a caravan which is coming from this side from the direction of sham and jabir said this must be Imam Zain al Abidin. This must be Ali ibn Husayn who is coming back. And then Atiya asked Jabir, "Tell me what does he look like? What does he look like? So that I can recognize if it's him or not because you can't see." And Jabir said, "He's a young man. 
He has noor on his face. So when you see him, you will recognize him. He's a special kind of a person. So as the person, the caravan came closer, Atiyah saw the caravan and he came back to Jabir and said, there is no young man there. There is an old person whose shoulders are slouched and he looks very weak. There is no young person there. And Jabir could not understand that. Anyway, when Imam Zainul Abidin saw Jabir, he recognized Jabir ibn Abdullah Ansari and he come, came down from the camel, from the horse, and he went to Jabir. said, Ya yeah, Jabir, we were damaged and destroyed in his land. My father was killed. My brother was killed. My little baby brother was killed. My uncles were killed. All my father's friends were killed. My aunties, my sisters, they were taken captive. They were treated like prisoners. Their childers were taken away. Their job was taken away. We have suffered a lot of humiliation. And they cried together and they cried together. And they fell down on the grounds of Karbala. After some time of giving consolation to each other, Imam said to Jabir, Oh, Jabir, can you go away from my father's burial place, please? Because my sisters, my aunties want to come. Well, he didn't have any sister left. But my aunties come to want to give their respects to my father. And Jabir said, Ya Ali ibn Hussain, I cannot see, let them come. And Imam Ali, Imam Ali ibn Hussain said, Oh, Jabir, my aunties, my mother, they are come, going to come and cry over here. I don't want you to hear their voices when they are waiting. So much care he had for the respect for the hijab of the, the lady of the household. Jabir went away and the ladies paid their respects at the tomb of Imam Hussain al Islam. And they were complaining of what they suffered. And Zainab al Islam was saying, Oh, my dear brother. I left you here and I left your daughter in Damascus, in the cell, in the dungeons of Damascus. I have nothing for you here now. Remember, Bibi Zainab's sons were killed in Karbala as well. She never ever cried for them because she wanted to cry for her brother. She wanted to cry for Ali Akbar. She never cried for her sons. And time elapsed in Karbala and they all started to go on to Medina. And when they reached the outskirts of Medina, <laughs> Imam Jalil Abedin sent a message across to say to announce in Medina in the Masjid of Rasulullah that to tell them that the, the damaged and the broken household of Rasulullah is here on the outskirts of Medina and whose head has been killed. He went around into the Masjid and he announced loudly Hussein has been killed and the household of Rasulullah is now reaching back to Medina. It's on the outskirts of Medina. There was one old lady who was very confused by that news that Hussein has been killed. So she asked grandson, help me, take me, let me give get me my stick, take me to the masjid. I'm going to ask him which Hussein is he talking about. And when she reached the, reached the masjid, she asked the person which Hussein has been killed. And he said, Hussein, son of Ali, the heart of Fatima Zahra, he has been killed. And the old lady could not believe it. He said, how can Hussein be killed? There is a boss with Hussein. How can Hussein be killed? And the man said, oh my dear lady, a boss was killed before Hussein. And the lady said, how is it possible that my Abbas is going to be killed? He's a very strong and skillful and brave fighter. And the man said, no, Abbas was there, but his hands were severed in trying to get the water from the river for the children. His hands were severed, and then the lady fell down on the floor of the masjid. And she said, I know Abbas, I know Abbas, he would never ever betray Hussein. He tried, must have tried his best, but I am crying now because when somebody's hands are severed, and they fall from a high place. How do they support themselves when they're falling down? Because everybody who falls from a high place, 
They used the hands as a support. But how did my Abbas come down from his horse when his hand was severed? And she cried for the situation in which Abbas fell down and cried and lamented for Hussein. And Zainab went to Rasulullah's grave and she complained to Rasulullah that Rasulullah, your Ummah did a lot of injustice to us. You know, I was beaten by chains. Hussein was killed, your grandson was killed. And if there was no known mahram here, I would remove my child and I would show you my hands. They are all blue because I was tied by ropes. And she went on to the grave of her mother and she paid condolences to her mother. She went to each and every house of the ladies who were there in Karbala and gave condolences there till the time her husband, Abdullah Jafar, Abdullah ibn Jafar, said to Imam Zainul Abdeen, my dear nephew, go and ask your auntie to come back home at least. And Bibi Zainab, once she was told by the Imam to go back home because Abdullah wants him or her home, she went to the house. She went to the house and she saw the two small places of prayer mats of her sons. And then she could not bear it anymore. She started wailing, oh my own, oh my Muhammad. I don't feel like living in this house anymore. This world is not worth living anymore. And she was crying and in tears. She was after all a mother. She had kept her emotions in check till that time. At that time, Abdullah ibn Jafar came into the house and he saw this lady weeping. And he said to her, my dear old lady, my wife is not at home. Who are you? What do you want? And then I looked at Abdullah and said, Abdullah, you did not rec recognize your, uh, your wife, Zainab. And Abdullah was in shock. What happened to you? You have aged so much. What happened to you? <laughs> and Lady Zainab said, Abdullah, my brother was killed. Little Ali Asghar was shot through his neck. Your sons were killed. We were taken captive. We went on to Sham on bare camelbacks. And <laughs> we were tied in ropes. And we were beaten with chains. Yeah, Abdullah, look at my arm. Abdullah fainted at the sight of Bibi Zainab's arm. Allah May Allah accept this little ibadah from us and give us the marfa of the Ahlul Bayt in a much better way than we already have. May Allah give us the tawfiq to learn from their lives and learn from the examples and be in practice of a righteous life, inshallah. May Allah accept the ziyarah of all the people who have gone to Arbain in Karbala right now. May Allah bring them back home safe. And may Allah keep all the Muslims guided and bring them all into the wilaya of Ali ibn Abi Talib al Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka'ta samir ali wa tukulayna inna ka'ta tawabu al Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Ziarat, please wait for Ziarat. Assalamu alaikum, ya Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum, ya Abna Rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum, ya Abna Amin Mu'mineen. Assalamu alaikum, ya Abna Fatima Tawdahra, Sayyid al-Dunsa al-Alameen. Assalamu alaikum, ya Hassan al-Mustaba. Assalamu alaikum, ya Hussein al-Shaheed al-Karbala. Assalamu alaikum, ya Hazrat al-Fas, ya Ibn Amir al-Mu'mineen. Assalamu alaikum, ya Tamam Shahadan al-Karbala, wa Siran al-Karbala, wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakat. Assalamu alaikum, ya Mawla wa Ibn Mawla. السلام عليك يا معين الضعفاء والفقراء السلطان أبو الحسن علي بن المطرضاء ورحمة الله وبركاته.
السلام عليك يا صاحب العزم والزمان السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن السلام عليك يا قاتل البرهان السلام عليك يا مظهر الإيمان السلام عليك يا إمامنا وإمام الإنس بلجان أجل الله تعالى فرجا وصلى الله تعالى مخرجا ظهورا ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك توجد ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وهي محافظة وقائدة وناسرة ودليلة وعينة فجاء تزكيه أعطاك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا